am delighted to be able to introduce our final speaker of the day, who is Dr. Jenna Healy. Some of us in the room were fortunate enough to attend uh, yesterday afternoon's panel on the history of home pregnancy testing that Mary Earl organized and that Meg and Jenna spoke to. Um, but focusing exclusively now on Professor Healy, she received her undergraduate degree from the University of Guelph in 2009 with a major in molecular biology proceeded to the history program in Toronto where she got her MA degree in 2010 and then earned her PhD from Yale University in 2016. Professor Healy is currently an assistant professor and adjacent A. Hannah Chair in the history of medicine at Queen's University where she teaches to medical students exclusively and when where one of her its challenges, responsibilities, is to find a way to integrate history more into the medical school curriculum. Her research explores the intersection of 20th century medicine, gender, technology, and health policy. She's written several articles um, online and in um, interview journals. Her current book project, tentatively entitled on Time, Age, Technology, and Reproduction in Modern America explores the temporal politics of reproduction through a history of the so-called biological check. Today, she will speak to us on the do-it-yourself pregnancy, um, which sounds very interesting, medicalization, <laughs> no men needed. <laughs> medicalization agency and the history of at-home ovulation and pregnancy. Test. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Healy. Thank you, uh, Andrea, very much for that introduction, and, and, and for Tomas and Lawrence for having me here today. I was delighted to be able to speak last night um, at the Osler Library event where we unveiled the predictor, the uh, Meg's uh, amazing first model of the pregnancy test, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit today. And yeah, I just realized the do-it-yourself pregnancy could be taken in a lot of ways, uh, but we ought to be talking a little bit about the mysterious absence of men uh, in the discourse around ovulation and pregnancy tests uh, and how the male contributions to reproduction are often erased. So I want to show you this image. Uh, it is of not the first pregnancy test, not the test that Meg designed, the predictor, um, but a, a slightly later model uh, that w hit the American markets and was uh, marketed to the mainstream uh, in 1978. And it was known as the EPT, the Early Pregnancy Test. Uh, later on, this acronym was re uh, renamed uh, to be an error-proof test, right, to try to talk about uh, accuracy. And so the reason why I'm showing the image of this particular test uh, is the very first uh, print ad for a pregnancy test was for uh, the EPT that appeared in a sort of a national magazine in the United States, uh, and it was in vogue in 1978. And the very first line of this very text-heavy ad was that the EPT in-home early pregnancy test is a private little revolution any woman can easily buy at her drugstore. And that's a very powerful piece of marketing copy. Um, it has gotten a lot of attention from historians as sort of representing what the home pregnancy test meant in the 1970s in midst uh, the sort of second wave feminism and the women's health movement, and we'll talk about that. Uh, as a historian, I'm always a little skeptical when I see the word revolution, as I think we all should be, right? That sort of sets off a lot of um, alarm bells for me. So is it that the introduction of the pregnancy test and the obvious test, is this a type of revolution? What is it revolutionizing, right? Who are the participants uh, in this revolution? And really just more broadly, right, that's a, a complicated way to ask, how have these technologies altered the relationship between patient and physician? And this is actually not a question I've engaged with a lot in my research, and so I'm actually uh, very delighted to be invited here today. I never <coughs> thought about disintermediation, but that's exactly what's going on here. And I think that pregnancy test is often held up, right, as this uh, very successful at-home diagnostic product that fundamentally changed this relationship. So what kind of revolution is it? What does it mean that it's little? And what does it mean that it's private? So if the historians in the room will forgive me for a minute, I'm just going to zoom way back. Um, and one of the reasons why I, I have to be talking about the history of women's health and reproduction is I think it's a, a perfect area of medicine to talk about disintermediation. Because in terms of historical time, physicians haven't necessarily had authority over women's health or sort of the reproductive processes for as long as they might have had authority over other areas of medicine. And it's always been a larger source of conflict. And so this is... Um, 
uh, 17th century Dutch painting uh, of the birthing room. And so one thing you'll notice that this uh, woman has just given birth, uh, there are no men in this room, right? It's a, it's a single gender space. And it was very rare that a physician would necessarily be allowed into a birthing room, right? This is basic for historians of medicine, but a midwife, right, would have been the practitioner uh, that would have had the expertise in birth. Um, and sort of early uh, nat uh early modern scientists right, were interested in the ways that the reproductive processes worked. It was all a bit mysterious and often referred to as the secrets of women, right? Literally, these are secrets of women's bodies uh, that male physicians might not have access to. And so here we see the woman who was given birth. Uh, we had the women in this uh, painting are labeled gossips, so the neighborhood women, uh, and they're being served um, treats, I believe, by the maid uh, in black. So it's the 18th century where we start to see a transition where we have um, the professionalization of obstetrics uh, and the introduction of what was then known as the male midwife. So literally regendering a traditional uh, medical practitioner uh, and is acknowledging that men are sort of starting to enter the birthing, birthing room. And so I love this engraving and it's a famous engraving from the very late 18th century of a male midwife. Um, we see he's split in half, right? On one side, he's a gentleman, right? On the other side, he is feminized in this way. And so it's, it's illuminating this tension that's going on, um, uh, whether or not men can have sort of knowledge or male physicians can have knowledge about women's bodies. Uh, we'll also know on the male side of the image, right, you'll see the forceps and the instrumentation. So one of the hallmarks of a male midwife as opposed to a female midwife is they were thought to be more interventionist. Now historians have sort of questioned whether or not this is actually true, but they certainly held up the forceps as a technological symbol of their superiority in terms of, uh, in terms of medicine. So I show this image, this is from the early 19th century, and it's an engraving uh, that is labeled the Declaration of Pregnancy. Now what's going on in this image, and the reason I like it when we think about pregnancy testing is what before the, the at-home pregnancy test was the moment of revelation like? when a woman discovered or realized or was told that she was pregnant or had that confirmed for her. And in this image, we see a young woman in the center uh, it, that is labeled to be her mother uh, next to her, maybe comforting her or, or getting the news with her, uh, and then the male physician uh, telling her um, or confirming that she is pregnant. And we don't know the backstory of the image. We don't know if she'd already suspected that she was pregnant, what types of physical signs uh, they might be confirming. But what's really interesting to me is in the background of this image, we see a woman at the door. That's a servant uh, who's listening in on the encounter. And so this is interesting because when we have the at-home pregnancy test, people are saying this is bringing back a moment. It's reclaiming it for women, bringing it back into the home. And this is certainly happening in the home. But we're also removing the doctor from that encounter, right? The doctor doesn't have to be there for this very intimate moment. But even we see in this moment in the home, She's not by herself, she's with her mother. There is in fact always this uh, threat that the news is gonna get out some other way. There's someone else listening um, and the male physician is there as well, being the one to, at least to deliver the news. So women, historians of women's health have talked about this sort of long durée, the medicalization of birth that happens throughout the 20th century. This encompasses a lot of things. It's the, uh, the move to hospital birth in the 20th century, um, lots of different obstetrical uh, innovations. This is a beautiful uh, pencil drawing of um, uh, fetal testing. This is an, amnes uh, an amniotic, am amniotic tap, I believe, that is being depicted here. Uh, and so there's a critique that goes on um, that culminates in the women's health movement uh, in the 1970s to jump through time, right, that it criticizes this medicalization of birth and the sort of the extension of male expertise and trying to reclaim uh, someone's some sort of female knowledge or, or authority over women's health. And here are two famous images from that early, uh, what's known as the women's health movement as a subsection of the second wave feminist movement. Of course, our bodies ourselves um, from the Boston Women's Health Book Collective. Uh, we saw the birth control handbook yesterday at the Ozer Library, so the McGill students' contribution in the late 1960s to these documents about uh, really sharing knowledge of woman to woman, right, about their reproductive health. Um, and a poster from the Berkeley Women's Health Collective in the early 1970s. So one thing you'll notice at the bottom of this image uh, is that it's all the different services that this women's health clinic is offering, and one of them just is pregnancy, and that would be the monitoring of pregnancy, but also the testing of pregnancy, and how significant the testing of pregnancy was um, uh, in this period of time. And so an even more specific subsection of the women's health movement was known as self-help. So the idea that you don't need a doctor to perform a lot of sort of basic reproductive health care. This is 
also a very famous image, a great image, um, from the cover of a feminist women's health magazine in uh, from Los Angeles in 1973. Uh, here's a Wonder Woman-like figure saying, with my speculum, I am strong, I can fight. And she's, she's literally snatching it from the hands of her gynecologist, right? And maybe going to hit him with it, right? If we sort of look. Um, and we actually have Planned Parenthood um, sort of being trampled underneath her feet. So the idea that we are totally rejecting the expertise of physicians, that we don't need this. Um, and often feminist health collectives would have workshops teaching women to use a speculum and a mirror in order to examine their own cervix, for example, to become familiar with their own biology, um, to sort of reclaim their own reproductive health care. And so, uh, as I mentioned, a large part of practice in these clinics was actually offering pregnancy testing in order to try to remove the physician from that encounter. Um, before this period of time, uh, women might have to go to the doctor to confirm a pregnancy. They could face judgment. Uh, they could face hesitation if the doctor didn't want to do the test as quickly as they wanted to. And the issue at stake here, of course, in this context is abortion, right? You have to get a, a test quite quickly, right, if you're going to seek out uh, an abortion and some physicians may not want them to offer that early confirmation. And so we see a lot of sort of emphasis on early pregnancy detection. And this is a great image from an article by Jesse Elsenko Grin, who I know a lot of you um, know has a McGill connection. Um, thinking about pregnancy testing as a feminist practice within these clinics, and this is an image um, from 1982 of uh, women actually together uh, using a, a test kit, whether or not that was um, purchased from a pharmacy or potentially I think they were actually getting them from uh, directly from a diagnostic laboratory to already cut out the doctor. Even if they're not doing it at home, they're going to a feminist clinic where the experience of getting the test done and the type of counseling they might receive looks very, very different. All right, back to the pregnancy test. So what I'm suggesting to do today is actually look at a, a technology that uh, my research uh, focuses on uh, that emerges right after the pregnancy test, which is actually the at-home uh, ovulation predictor kit. And so if the pregnancy test uh, is available in the mainstream in 1978, uh, ovulation prediction kits uh, are available in pharmacies <laughs> as early as 1985. And on the surface, they look quite different, uh, quite the si similar, right? They're both diagnostic kits. They're both aimed towards women. They're both sort of uh, aimed at this uh, early stage uh, of a pregnancy. One detects when ovulation occurs to help facilitate conception. The other detects whether or not a conception uh, has occurred. So in this context, uh, my research mostly looks at uh, temporal politics. So thinking about the ways in which technology has altered women's sense of their own biological time. The big one is the biological clock. That expression actually emerges 1978, the same year pregnancy tests become available in the mainstream, the same year that IVF is first uh, successfully completed. Um, and so there's a lot of, uh, I, I argue that there's something going on here in terms of shifting ideas about women's understanding of their own temporal rhythms. But today instead, I'll think a little bit more about what the ovulation test has to say about disintermediation. Uh, and, and specifically about the ways in which this narrative actually might be a little bit different than the pregnancy test. And the pregnancy test is held up as a private little revolution, as something that really kind of cuts the doctor out. I don't actually think that's what's going on with the ovulation test. Uh, instead, in some ways, it's actually bringing women and physicians closer together, especially in the realm of infertility care. And so that's something uh, we'll get into. So to give an outline for my talk today, um, I'm going to start with a little bit of an early history of ovulation testing before uh, these diagnostic test kits. Uh, and I'm using this as an example of a time period where I actually think ovulation testing was quite radical, but that's because it was contraception. It was a way to improve the rhythm method um, and sort of give a, a group of women access to contraception when they might not have had it otherwise. Uh, then I'll think about mediating the at-home revolution. So this early period of time where we have these pharmaceutical interventions, uh, uh, sort of at-home uh, tests, and, and the role of the corporation specifically, or, or, or the, the manufacturers, in mediating this new relationship between doctors and patients. They have to A, convince women that they should do these tests at home, that they're capable of doing these tests at home. Uh, but they also have to convince doctors to let this happen, right? And also try to convince doctors why this is a good thing for them. And so, I'm suggesting the corporation is sort of a third person here, right? We've been talking a lot about doctors and patients, but this has actually been coming up again and again. What about <coughs> business interests? What about corporations? What role are they playing in allowing this sort of separation of healthcare um, out from the medical mainstream? Uh, and lastly, I'll reflect a little bit uh, on digital 
technologies. And this is another thing we've talked about a lot today. What are the precursors to the internet and the ways in which this is changing patient care? <laughs> this is certainly true um, for uh, at-home reproductive testing. Uh, that image there is a Bluetooth pregnancy test app. So you can now pee on a stick and it will upload directly the results to your iPhone. Um, and we'll talk a little about the internet communities that have actually sprung up around the uses of these technologies. And I argue that it shows that you can't think about an at-home technology in one way. There's actually lots of different groups of users that are using them very differently. So prior to the 1930s, ovulation was poorly understood. There were no laboratory or home tests for detecting ovulation. Uh, there was a belief that women experienced ultimate periods of sterility and fertility, and that goes back to antiquity. And scientists often disagreed about when those exact periods occurred. So in the 19th century, there was some research done in lower animals that, that claimed that ovulation happened during menstruation. And so a lot of clergymen or physicians would advise women um, to only have sex during a safe period if they didn't want to conceive. Unfortunately, the safe period of the late 19th century was the period in which ovulation occurred. So a lot of women expressed dissatisfaction with this advice, probably because it was exactly wrong uh, and actually led to a, a lot of conception. So the idea of a safe period is much older than the 1930s, um, uh, but the, the science wasn't quite there yet to back it up. So it wasn't until about the late 1920s uh, when that scientific consens consensus about the timing of ovulation began to emerge. Uh, it grew out of the work of two physicians, Hermann Naus in Austria and Kusako Ogino in Japan, who independently came to the conclusion that ovulation occurs only once a month during the midpoint of the human menstrual cycle. So almost immediately, their theories about the timing of ovulation were translated into clinically applicable rules for practicing periodic uh, abstinence, which is a fancy way of saying uh, the rhythm method. So it was on a trip to Germany in 1931 that American Catholic physician Leo Latz first heard about Nelson's research and, uh, and um, sought the support of wealthy Catholic patrons in Chicago to fund this book that comes out in 1932, which is called The Rhythm of Fertility and Sterility. And this is actually where the term the rhythm method comes from. And this provided American women with practical instructions for employing this method of birth control. So this is an enormously successful text. And, and what I find interesting about this is when the physician found out about this theory, it automatically goes to popularization, right? We're getting this knowledge directly out to a very large number of patients. The book sold over 100,000 copies in just two years and inspired ca countless other books and pamphlets promoting the method. Soon, both the American medical community and the Catholic Church were buzzing about this new method of birth control um, that, that was fit into Catholic dogma and was sort of allowed under Catholic dogma. And so it's not hard to explain why there might be enthusiasm for the method, both demand from Catholic women to have a sort of religiously acceptable form of birth control. It's also the 1930s, right? We're in the midst of the Great Depression, and it takes on a new urgency, right, to, to sort of maybe avoid or delay having children um, or to limit the size of one's family. So inspired by the popularity of this method, uh, there's lots of evidence that entrepreneurs uh, began marketing a variety of devices to help women use this method and track their fertility. So here are a bunch of different ones. The first of which is the CONSIP calendar, um, uh, and it's dis distributed in the United States in 1931 at a, a company out of Hobart, Indiana. And it has actually four different wheels that you can turn. It actually, uh, you're, there's an option to account for a leap year, right? And to sort of keep track of when your um, uh, cycle is. And so you can uh, practice uh, periodic abstinence. The second is the scientific prediction dial. Um, and what I find very interesting about this is actually if you look at the top of the image, uh, it says uh, for use by physicians, obstetricians, and gynecologists. And so sometimes they would in fact prescribe this to their patients, Catholic patients as a method. Um, I haven't been able to determine if it could also be purchased separately, uh, not necessarily through a physician. So there's still some physician control, but once a woman had this in her hands, right, she could potentially control her fertility in a way that she wasn't able to before. And the last is this rhythm meter from 1944. Uh, it's a much more complicated and actually even it has uh, different mechanisms to account for June and April and, and months that have shorter days, right? And to sort of try to make them the most accurate um, calculations possible. So the next technology that's introduced for detecting ovulation is a classic one. It's the thermometer uh, and with the basal body temperature method for charting ovulation. 
um, in 1944, uh, the thermometer was promoted as a new tool for making ovulation invisible. And this, this basal temperature thermometer in 1951 was created by Becton Dixon. Um, and it was specifically for women. And I often think you look at how, how it looks very discreet. It looks like a pen, right? And you might keep this on your bedside table uh, if you are um, performing basal temperature calculations. Um, so the, the relationship between temperature and menstrual cycle have been identified as early as 1904, but it wasn't applied in clinical practice until the 1940s. It required women to take their temperature every morning, uh, either under their tongue or vaginally or rectally, and to carefully record their findings. And we're going back to the idea of record keeping, right? This had to be a very precise type of record keeping. Women were trained to look for a small dip in temperature, followed by a sudden increase, uh, which is a, a square root symbol, right? They used to be taught, um, which indicated that ovulation had just occurred. So the problem with this method is it tells you when ovulation is already over and not right before it begins. And this is a constant um, uh, point of complaint for women, but at least it lets you figure out if your cycle is longer than normal, for example, which is one of the problems with the rhythm method, um, and sort of figure out when your average ovulation day uh, occurred. Uh, this is a method that physicians will uh, sort of tell patients about or teach them about, but there's not a lot of entrepreneurial uh, opportunities. You buy a thermometer once, they don't cost that much money, uh, and they don't sort of have the same um, uh, reusable, um, uh, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought, sort of the idea that you can buy them over and over uh, like you can with later ovulation tests. So enter my last technology that I'm going to talk about in this sort of early ovulation technology, and that is something known as the fertility tester. And so the fertility tester was the brainchild of this physician here, Joseph B. Doyle, who's also Catholic. He's practicing at the St. Elizabeth Hospital in Boston. And in 1958, he publishes an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association um, that points to a new method for detecting ovulation. He argues that because the sugar content of cervical mucus peaks immediately before ovulation, that you could track glucose levels in the cervix, uh, and then you could create a simple test for determining if an egg was released. And so he suggests women use the following, uh, basically a, a package of test tape, so diabetic testing tape that can help detect <laughs> glucose, uh, and the cardboard applicator of a Tampax tampon. So you can get them both at the drugstore, and it's kind of a, a, an improvised home fertility test. And this is actually an article from the Washington Post giving women instructions uh, about how to do this. And the idea was that it was predictive, that you could tell right before ovulation was going to occur, um, and that it was cheap and it was discreet. Um, uh, way of doing this. And Doyle actually referred to this as a, a, a boudoir test in his JAMA article, uh, that women could do this in the privacy of their own uh, rooms. No one had to know, um, and it's especially appealing for Catholic women. So the funny thing about Doyle is he was very insistent that this was not a birth control method. Even though it had very obvious implications for the rhythm method, he didn't want to be associated with promoting birth control because in 1958, that was still uh, morally questionable. So he said, this is for women who desperately want to get pregnant. And so he ends up marketing the fertility tester, which is a, a version of this test that comes all together in the same box. So a pre-prepared version of this test. Um, and we see it here. It's out of a, a, a Illinois uh, company. That, so he is one of the owners of this company himself. Uh, and this is an advertisement of the Los Angeles Times for this. And here we can see for the millions of women uh, having difficulty in achieving pregnancy, uh, and it goes on and on. Um, married women. Oh, yes, and married women, right? So the interesting thing about this, just like all contraceptive ads at this period, there's a lot of double speak going on. It's, if you really want a baby, you can use this, you can uh, detect, pinpoint your point of ovulation. But the very last sentence, the fertility test is offered to all married women who have a reason for its use, right? So that's like a little bit of a hint uh, that you could also use it for contraceptive purposes. And I think in this way, it is an empowering technology for women uh, who might not be able to access contraception from their physicians or maybe with their husband's knowledge as well. So the, I included these, they're very different, right, than from the later ovulation technologies, um, but I think they're interesting because one, they're very different because they're for detecting um, uh, uh, ovulation for the purposes of birth control. And what's interesting about the fertility tester is by the late 60s, we actually start to see lots of advertisements for it in Catholic-only magazines. So periodicals for Catholic women, and they're no longer beating around the bush about what it's for. They said, this is for perfecting your rhythm. 
right? By the early 1970s, this company goes out of business because even by this time, 70% of Catholic women are no longer using the rhythm method and have switched to other methods, right? This is part of a big cultural shift and a rejection uh, of rhythm more generally. So now I want to get uh, to talking about the mediating uh, the at-home revolution. So I have notes on my other PowerPoint, so I'm sort of doing them at the same time. So what is the role of the corporation in, in making at-home pregnancy and ovulation testings uh, legible? And I like that word, legible, right? How do we convince everyone that this is something uh, that makes sense for both patients and physicians? And I think it's very different. And so just to give you a little bit of background about um, the actual marketing of these tests, and so we have the at-home test in the American marketplace, and this uh, I'm an American historian, so I do look specifically at the United States. Uh, pregnancy, this is the earliest in 1971, and that's with the predictor that Meg uh, helped uh, or did design and was in fact her idea. Um, it, there's a lot of regulatory issues in the United States in the early 1970s. The OVA-2 uh, is another um, uh, version of the test that comes out and actually gets recalled by the FDA. So there's regulatory changes that need to happen before uh, this can uh, succeed in the United States. And by 1978, we start to see a lot of different brands, EPT, Predictor, um, this uh, test called The Answer. Uh, on the other hand, we have first, the first response uh, and OBUTIME are the first two brands of ovulation tests in 1985. And there's two technical breakthroughs that allow this to happen for ovulation. One is in the 1970s, scientists realized that there's a surge of lut luteinizing hormone, or LH, that immediately precedes ovulation. So that gives the test something to measure. If you can detect the level of luteinizing hormone, then you can predict when ovulation is imminent. Um, the other thing that allowed the sort of um, uh, industry in at-home diagnostics to thrive uh, is the perfection of monoclonal antibody technology. Uh, so the ability to create a large amount of reagent that was able to bind to a specific substance for pregnancy tests that was HCG or um, uh, human... Chorionic gonadotropin. There you go. <laughs> and then uh, and for uh, ovulation, it was LH or, or luteinizing hormone. And so one thing you see over and over... Uh, I find it very interesting that when Meg first came up with the idea, right, there was a resistance, right, to this oh, idea. absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. well, who needs this and why do we need it? And also companies being, they're going to lose their own business, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's diagnostic companies. They're the ones who are doing the tests for doctor's offices and that they have market share to lose. Uh, it's only after they start marketing the at-home tests, it really proves the concept that women are very willing to buy it. And they're really actually not that cheap uh, for a drugstore object. Uh, and so suddenly, I'm, I've looked at a lot of corporate documents, you see unbridled enthusiasm for the category of the at-home diagnostic because it seems like a limitless market. It's hard to come by exact numbers because so many of these documents are sort of advertisements for the different companies. Uh, but there's uh, between 50 and $100 million in sales for pregnancy tests in the first decade of on the market. And there's all sorts of exponential um, uh, predictions uh, of what's going to happen. And so this is actually from um, a private uh, uh, annual report of the company Monoclonal Antibodies Incorporated from 1985. And this is for their investors showing the exponential market growth as they introduce new products. And so it's hard to see that the first one is uh, different types of pregnancy tests that they're developing. And then finally, this ovustic ovulation test. And something that comes up again and again in corporate documents is that women who want to conceive a child will buy anything. They're the perfect market. You could sell them anything. And you actually see a lot of companies being founded around this period of time, <laughs> assuming that this is the case. So there's a, two genres of advertising for these early at-home tests. And I think I'm using marketing materials to figure out the narratives that the companies are selling. One is to the patients. And so for pregnancy testing, that's the direct-to-consumer ads, and something like here in the Ladies' Home Journal in December 1978. Um, and a lot of the early pregnancy ads, as historians have noted, have, have women in them. They do not, the men are usually absent. And this is to ap appeal to a woman potentially who is single, right, who is scared to be pregnant. You have to try to capture that ambiguity that there are people who want a positive result and people who don't want a positive result. So you don't usually see couples uh, on the early pregnancy test advertisements. Uh, and so it's interesting to see this test, uh, this advertisement, because it goes on and on about accuracy. Like this is an accurate test. It's just like the one they do in your doctor's lab. And there's actually a statement in this that says, your doctor understands how it works and will help you decide if it's right for you. So they're actually telling the women who see this ad in Ladies Home Journal, go talk to your doctor about buying this test at the pharmacy so you could do it yourself at home 
so that you can then go to the doctor to confirm the result. And I find this, this a little bit odd, but it's also just trying to, um, I think, imbue the test with a sense of authority, of medical authority. So not quite the revolutionary in the same way. It doesn't necessarily have that do-it-yourself feminist ethos that's happening in feminist health clinics. So the direct-to-consumer advertising for ovulation tests looks a little different. It almost always has couples. We see men here for the first time. Uh, they're always, I always call them yuppies. They're the most yuppie looking 1980s couple, um, and a sweater vest, uh, always a wedding ring. There's never an ovulation test without a wedding ring. So there's a very conservative ethos to who they're advertising this to. Uh, and it's trying to convince people that they're going to miss their window to have a baby. So the interesting thing about the difference between ovulation and pregnancy tests is for ovulation, people have been getting pregnant for a long time without using an ovulation test. Um, and so there's actually a lot of um, text on these ads that says, did you know that your window for getting pregnant only lasts 12 hours? If you don't have sex in those 12 hours, like you will not have a baby, right? And actually a, like a lot of language around scaring people into you need this technology in order to get this um, outcome that you want. Direct to physician advertising looks totally different during this period of time. And actually in my own research, I've come across much larger volumes of marketing material directed directly at physicians uh, about both pregnancy and ovulation tests than I have for the direct to consumer side. There are the, these advertisements in Vogue and Ladies Home Journal that often run the same ones over and over, but there's an abundance of different types of advertisements aimed at physicians. This is a famous one. It appeared in the American Journal of Public Health in 1979. Um, and it starts to make this argument about why home testing might be good for the medical profession. And this says after two months of pregnancy, 56% of women have not yet consulted a physician. The home pregnancy test can help bring women to earlier care. So the idea is if women are detecting pregnancy earlier and earlier at home, they will come see you in a more timely manner and you will get more patients. Um, this is neglecting the fact that most or a lot of women who are doing the pregnancy test uh, might not want to continue with their pregnancy, uh, but then they would go seek an abortion care provider. So it sort of encompasses both possibilities. There's also a genre that's quite common, trying to assure physicians that women can handle this new responsibility. So just as the director consumer ad is trying to convince the woman that she's capable of doing this and it's an error-free test and it's very accurate, there's a lot of work trying to convince physicians uh, that women can, can do this. And so this is the Q test. And interestingly, the Q test is produced by Becton Dixon, who produced the basal thermometer. Uh, they said, of course, we're going to get into ovulation tests because we're, we've been in the business of ovulation for 40 years. They actually use this in their marketing materials. Uh, and so the interesting thing I want to point about this advertisement, of course, there's no simpler test in patients' hands. Uh, the patient is always, of course, a woman. We often have lots of nice manicures in these images. Um, the circle there with the test strip, uh, that's called an error-proof strip. And so the idea was that we have built something into this technology that will uh, alert you to if they actually left it exposed to reagent too long and, and for you not to trust this test, right? So if the woman screwed it up, you'll know because you'll be able to tell from this sort of uh, error strip. And to be fair, right? Uh, and I think as Meg can attest to, the, the earlier pregnancy tests were a lot more complicated to complete, not impossible, um, but they did a look a little bit more like a home chemistry kit than now. And so this is a, an instruction booklet from 1986 for that very same Q test uh, of the different steps and reagents and sort of periods of time you had to wait uh, in between each step. Um, and I was noting to Meg last night, the instructions that you designed for the predictor in 1971 are much nicer. And I think much more complete and easier to understand uh, than the ones that well, came. Use color. Yeah, you use color, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and this is actually, this is way blown up. This booklet is only about this big, stuck oh. into the box of the pregnancy test or the ovulation test. Uh, and lastly, we have this uh, advertisement for first response. Uh, so it goes on and on about the, the trials they did for this test. Um, uh, they took 32 unskilled women whatever that means. Uh, and they said that 31 out of 32 of them didn't screw it up. Uh, we gave them one sample of urine with LH in it, one <laughs> sample that didn't. Uh, they, all of them could tell the difference, uh, except, for, for, except for one person. We had someone supervising them the whole time to make sure they followed the instructions. Basically, and there's a gender dynamic going on here that, you know, female patients are capable of doing this. So merely beyond convincing physicians that this was safe, that this was effective, that women were capable of doing these tests, uh, manufacturers were selling physicians on a different narrative. And this was that home testing was good for them, right? It wasn't cutting out their business, but in fact, enhancing it. 
And so there's this great document that I discovered in the um, archives of ACOG, uh, which is about this ovulation detection calculator. It's right there. It's called the Ovu Guide, uh, and it, it has a bunch of dials on the side, and it's essentially a really fancy rhythm meter from the 1930s, except you can um, actually use coital frequency as one of the dials, so like how much sperm depletion there is. So they add this in as um, a, a variable that you can then use with your ovulation cycles as well. And so this document, it's many pages, it's a kind of a booklet, and it's an illustrated conference panel. Um, you see this four male physicians here, and it's them talking about this calculator and how great it is for their infertility patients. So when we talk about disintermediation, right? It's just physicians. There are no patients here at all. It's a bunch of physicians talking about this technology that's for women. Male physicians, I should say. And so there's lots of arguments in this document uh, about enhancing patient trust and satisfaction. Uh, and you can actually see here, it says the, uh, the OVU guide helps the patient become pregnant quickly after therapy. And this is how she judges the physician. So they're saying, this is going to make women pleased with your services uh, because they'll get pregnant more quickly. Uh, and they'll tell their friends about you, uh, that you're a good fertility physician because you helped them conceive. Um, and in another paragraph here, there's a, an interesting expression. They say, uh, what we really have to say to women at first when they come to a fertility clinic is, yes, we'll just do nothing except simply wait for chance and just explain to them that their timing is off. But he said, but if we can give them this tool, it looks like we're, it was worthwhile coming to us and it looks like we're making an intervention. And so there's actually a bolstering of physician authority here by them being the ones to proffer the tool uh, to women. Uh, and this is a quite later advertisement from First Response. Uh, I just like this. It makes it easier for you to place a baby in her arms, right? So if your job as a physician is to help the woman have a child, it's a lot of pronatalism here. And of course, there's no man in this image. It's the, she wants the baby and you're going to give her the baby. There was also arguments that these devices would help physicians collect patient data more accurately. This is another crazy 1980s ovulation detection device. Uh, it's called the Fertilicron. Uh, marketed in Canada, actually, as the BioSelf, and I, I haven't figured out why they had a different name. Uh, it is just a thermometer. What you see plugged in there to the printer is a basal temperature thermometer. Uh, and women could take their temperature every day, and they plugged it into this mini computer. It's supposed to be kept, keep it next to your bed, and it stores all the data for you. And, the, and the, one of the advantages is that you could print out right, your basal chart, and the advertisement to physicians was, this benefits you just as much as it benefits the patients, because patients are terrible at keeping records, right? But if you have this computer, you know that they're doing it correctly. And actually, one of the features of this device is you could, like, over telephone wires, if you hooked it up, you could actually send it directly to your physician's office. Uh, so women could take their temperature in the morning. It would be recorded in this device. And there was a little bit of um, suggestion that they could use algorithms using these computers to help predict ovulation, but that doesn't quite come to pass, uh, really, until iPhone apps. And lastly, I argue that ovulation tests were a boon to the emerging specialty of infertility medicine. Infertility medicine always existed, but in the 1980s, um, uh, it was uh, becoming more and more popular. And so ovulation testing actually helped choreograph the clinic. It helped you know when to come in for artificial insemination, et cetera. And so it really helped bolster that industry of sort of connecting the patient and the doctor. And lastly, I'll just include, uh, I found a lot of evidence of insurance reimbursement for pregnancy and ovulation tests, which is actually implying that they're being prescribed so the physician is still prescribing them, even though, uh, and you can get reimbursed for your purchase at the drugstore. So I want to conclude by just thinking about what are the implications of this and how have the uses of these technologies evolved. And so uh, there's this great book uh, by a sociologist named Miranda Wagner, The Zero Trimester, that's talking about the, sort of the expansion of pregnancy before conception. There's this period of time before pregnancy where you want to optimize the results. And I think that's where pregnancy and ovulation tests have helped shape a culture of sort of preparing for conception, for optimizing conception. And this isn't quite medicalization, but it's biomedicalization, right? Looking at the theories of uh, Adele Clark and Michelle Murphy, right? It's a new type of um, patient um, uh, cooperation and sort of the, the monitoring of one's own body. And I don't know if that's empowering or if it's not, right? I think people could see it both ways. One, you're more in touch with your body. The other is you're being asked to do all of these tasks. And I think this is very evident in the world of uh, TTC, 
hashtag TTC. It's a whole online world about women who are trying to conceive children and the community they have created around this. Uh, if you search pregnancy tests uh, or live pregnancy tests or live ovulation tests on YouTube, you'll get thousands of hits. Uh, this is a very interesting genre. Uh, and it's women sort of sharing this uh, within communities. And this is a screenshot of one of these tests. Uh, I have a little bit of some reservations, right? These tests are all, all these videos are public, but I don't know if I want to show someone's face in a presentation, but this is her, her diary, right? And I think it goes back uh, to Olivia's great presentation, right? Of record keeping, and she's keeping track of every single ovulation test she takes, uh, and most of them are negative. And she knows they're going to be negative because she has been tracking her cycle for years. Um, but we have the smiley face next to the one where the double line finally shows up bright enough uh, for there to be ovulation. And so I think there's a, a lot of interesting things to be uh, said here. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into something that maybe shouldn't have to take so much work. But there's a lot of relishing within these communities and sharing of expertise. And this is the trying to conceive form on a website called twoweekwait.com. <coughs> The two week wait is the time between ovulation and when you are supposed to take your first pregnancy test. Most women will, in these forms, will say, oh, I'll start taking them at day seven, even though on the package it says they won't work until day 14, uh, just because they want to see the earliest time that line, that double line uh, might display itself. And these forms are amazing because there is so much helping and sort of a, a group identity that emerges and a lot of patient expertise. There's a whole acronym dictionary you have to study in order to be understand their posts. But doctors are still here. They're talking about bring this into your doctor, ask your doctor about this, bring them, bring this study into them. So doctors aren't absent, but the relationship is one of empowerment for the patient. So uh, what I really like is this quote um, from Joan Robinson, who's a sociologist uh, who wrote a great article on pregnancy testing a couple years ago, and she said, brought on by self-diagnosis and the movement to optimization, I think doctors and patients were rendered partners in the reproductive endeavor. And I like that actually more than just intermediation. It's not physicians being pushed out, it's patients and doctors being put into a partnership with each other. And lastly, just thinking about digital technologies, right? We have all sorts of new points of contact and surveillance, the Bluetooth pregnancy test when it was first announced in 2016. There are millions of snarky articles on the internet being like, why the heck would a woman need a Bluetooth enabled pregnancy test? Um, but what I love about this is the screen that says, yes, congratulations, you're pregnant. And interestingly, the app has a mode, if you don't wanna get pregnant, they won't congratulate you. So at the beginning you say, what result are you hoping to get? And they'll actually customize the app experience based on that. But you'll notice that this one says, yes, congratulations, you're pregnant. And it will say, calculate estimated due date. And then it says, add doctor's appointment. You can book your first doctor prenatal care appointment from the app, right? So when we think about, this is not necessarily separating women from medical care. It's actually facilitating their entry into what is quite a medicalized process of birth. And lastly, we've seen a surge in uh, fertility tracking apps that are complementary to ovulation tests um, or in some places are replacing them. Uh, the most popular one is called Flow uh, for both Android and iPhone. It has 26 million active monthly users and 100 million downloads in the United States alone. So if you think about the numbers of women who might actually be acting these, uh, using these apps, you can use them to try to conceive, you can use them to track your pregnancy, you can enter in information about your cervical mucus uh, appearance and your cramping and your acne, right? And to try to sort of track all of this. And there's been new concerns recently that who's getting this data, how secure is this data? There's evidence that employers are buying it to try to see if their employees are trying to get pregnant, right? So when we talk about the pregnancy test be helping you be private, these apps are certainly doing the opposite because you're uploading your reproductive information uh, into the cloud. I think there's a lot to talk about there. And so just to compare these two moments, right, going back to the beginning, right, we have the gossip uh, at the back, at the servant who's listening in. Well, who's listening in, right, to your Bluetooth pregnancy app? Uh, where is this data being stored? And is it your insurance company or your employer who can find out about your pregnancy at the moment it happens? Uh, so that's all I have for today. I'm looking forward to discussion. Questions? I'd like to know, is there a pill yet for the pre-pregnancy time? How the pharmaceutical companies gotten onto that now? Uh, well, there's prenatal vitamins, certainly, uh, as, a, as a big industry, but yeah, not quite a pill yet. Okay. <laughs> That's specifically for um, preconception. <laughs> when did women stop being the arbiters of when they were pregnant? When did doctors actually 
I mean, there. I know from the Middle Ages that there are supposedly kind of pregnancy tests based on women's urine. Mm -hmm. that, but at what it's point did urine, yeah. women not believe they were pregnant until some doctor told them so? Yeah, I think the 19th century would be where the rise. Of and what, what criterion did the doctors use mm -hmm. to determine that a woman was pregnant? That you know, that transferred this authority. Yeah, I, from what I know, it's a physical examination, and uh, other uh, strains of pregnancy testing can um, sort of correct me, but it's just, it, have you missed your periods, right? Um, and so the big problem, right, with physical diagnosis is, do you have an ovarian tumor, or are you pregnant? Right, and this is a differential diagnosis that was quite tricky to right. make. Um, and there are some stories in the 19th century of physicians getting that wrong. Right. So diagnosing as a fetal tumor, when in fact it was like a six-month pregnancy. And you're right that a lot of times women would have known they were pregnant. They wouldn't necessarily even sought that out from a physician. It's the 20th century where we start to see laboratory tests in the late 1920s, um, the injection of rabbits with uh, urine, uh, and then later on frogs. Um, and that's when women really don't believe it till they go to the doctor. And even now, a lot of these women on these YouTube videos will say, uh, I've done seven pregnancy tests. They're all positive. I can't wait to go to the doctor and get a real confirmation. So they, even they don't trust these tests that they're using, right? It's still the doctor who's the arbiter of whether or not you were truly pregnant or not. Um, but yeah, you see these physical diagnoses in the 19th century, and then 20th century is the laboratory confirmation that you have to go to your doctor to get. Yeah. So thanks for that presentation. I, the question I have for you has to do with the, the sort of split of the advertising you know, between direct-to-consumer and mm -hmm. physician. And I guess the question is, um, does it, why does it surprise you that there's more and more variation for ads to physicians than to consumers? On, on some level, that's what I would expect, mm -hmm. because the challenge of marketing this is not actually creating demand, mm -hmm. right? Which would suggest do a blitz creek and try to consume recoveries. And the challenge of marketing it is negotiating the trickiness of potential physician opposition mm -hmm. and the sense that there's a transgression of the sort of area in which different companies that are sort of peri pharmaceutical companies can advertise to the general public, but are also expected to primarily advertise to physicians. So, mm -hmm. in a sense, they're conforming to what would seem to be a really reasonable marketing strategy mm -hmm. for a company entering into this terrain right now. Yeah, and wonder what the, the um, gap was from the time the women had the test themselves and the doctors start getting. Marketing from the company. I think it's simultaneous, uh, or even I see some pretty early advertisements to physicians sort of about that concept. Um, it's a good question. Maybe it's my bias coming to it as the idea of this test being um, this this thing that revolutionized women's health or allowed them to sort of take authority. And I think there's been actually a lot of historical, great historical work done on direct-to-consumer advertising for pregnancy tests. And so I often thought of this as, a, as a, something that people had to bring up to the public and the public had to be convinced. And maybe it was my naivete about the volume of advertisements that are directed towards uh, uh, professionals. And what I find interesting, it's not just convincing the doctors that this is good for them, though as I showed many examples that was the case, there was a huge push by the late 80s that you should either be prescribing these tests or telling your patients to go out and get them. So it's actually another way to get it right, of course, at the patient um, and to sort of increase their sales um, because most sales after the late 1980s are happening out of drugstores, but that doesn't mean, as I showed that, right, that physicians aren't promoting it. But you're right, maybe it's the most logical strategy that they have the power to reach physicians um, and it's interesting to me, I first came across the direct physician advertisements in journals, right? Journal of Reproductive Medicine, uh, Fertility and Sterility. But it's when I got into these archives, uh, particularly of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, they just had a, a file folder and it was like this thick and it was just voluminous marketing material. So part of it's also where I'm looking. Um, but and very glossy, uh, as I'm sure you've seen, um, advertisements towards uh, physicians um, and sort of creative different ways uh, to promote this. So you're right. Maybe I shouldn't have been surprised by that. Yeah. Can I follow up on that question yeah. really quickly? To what extent do you think you're telling a story or you're showing continuity across this big swath of time? Because the app is that says book your first appointment is doing the same thing as those direct to physician advertisements, which is trying to appeal to the potentially suspicious doctors by saying, hey, you can get to your patients sooner. Yeah, and so even they're doing the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think this is a, I guess? I think it's an alternative narrative to the one that historians have told about pregnancy tests, which I also think is right that 
it hits in a cultural moment in which women are reclaiming or very being vocal about reclaiming their own reproductive power and their own re control over their own reproductive health. And there's lots of other evidence for this period of time. Um, but that doesn't mean what, that's what the manufacturers of the pregnancy tests are trying to tap into or the sort of narratives that the medical profession. So I do think that there's always, even with this at-home testing, um, sort of uh, medical authority never goes away. So I guess I am trying to look uh, for the continuity uh, there in between it. Um, there's still this concern um, mm -hmm. about potential opposition from physicians, right? That yeah. the app is more appealing for possibly both physicians because it's letting your, getting, making sure your patient gets to you quicker. Yeah, and the other interesting thing about pregnancy tests specifically is there's almost, there's not tons of evidence that doctors were really ever against it. They were skeptical. They were skeptical about it. They were skeptical of, um, they thought it would cause a lot of stress for women to be by themselves during that moment. And that's a bit of a paternalistic thing to assume, A, that women would be doing them by themselves and not with their family or their, their partners. Um, uh, but also that the stress would then affect the pregnancy. You actually see that a lot. Like, it's going to be so stressful to find this out on your own. It could physiologically affect them. And this is sort of a short-lived um, uh, objection. But the, the most vocal group against the promotion of these tests is diagnostic companies and laboratories because they're the ones if they weren't on this bandwagon they were going to lose tons and tons of business and so um there's actually a few doctors that say like oh yeah we don't this is fine we already outsource it to the to the diagnostic lab we'll just outsource it to the patient right and for them they're actually not even really that worried about their authority being challenged which is sort of then interesting to look at all of these um uh, sort of uh, materials directed towards physicians trying to comfort them um, and sort of convince them of something that they don't actually seem that worried about, at least in the infertility literature. Um, I think doctors are delighted that more and more women are becoming uh, sort of interested in their fertility and they don't care how it happens. Yeah. Yes. Just, just a quick one. Just a quick statement. It's interesting from a sociological standpoint, but you know, fertility tests are really the biggest chunk of the market. If I take my field, you know, in infectious diseases, people have tried to market HIV tests, hepatitis C tests, hepatitis B tests, group A strep tests, influenza tests, all kinds of tests, and they always, in the end, always fail. You know, they're like it's always a small part of the market. I think they they tried cholesterol tests at one point. You can still get your cholesterol, but you know, when you go to the pharmacy. It's still like, uh, you know, maybe a few tests here and there. But for whatever reasons, anything that has to do with fertility has always been very successful in terms of do-it-yourself tests. And it's probably, I mean, from a medical standpoint, it's probably a very small proportion of all the tests we do in an institution. But from an outside perspective, do-it-yourself, it's probably the big chunk of the market. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, and, and, and there are other good reasons to have, let's say, your, your own influenza test, you know, for example. You know, you have the flu, you want to know if you have the flu, yes or no. I mean, it could have some potential benefits, but it hasn't been successful. And, I mean, there's probably a reason to all of this. I mean, it, as you say, it could be uh, empowering women, like, it could be, like, something which is, like, you know, like more important for women. I think it's also the fact that whether you have a positive or a negative test doesn't really matter. Um, the immediate consequences are probably not as dramatic if, let's say, you have an HIV test and you do it by yourself on a Saturday evening, you know, and at 10.30 and it comes back positive, you know. What would you do right away, you know? And people would certainly panic and, and, and the consequences of all of this. Yeah. I, I, oh, do you want to... I, I just wanted to add something from the perspective of the genetics. I'm a cancer genetic specialist, but many people don't know that before 14 weeks pregnancy, the rate of miscarriage, uh, a spontaneous um, miscarriage, can be significant. And women in today's world get pregnant around age 35, which is considered to be advanced maternal, maternal age. So if someone is really trying to have a baby <coughs> with the age factor, advanced maternal age, uh, there is potential to recruit those women who are worried about miscarriage, that the sooner they get to the doctor, the better the chance mm -hmm. to also keep that pregnancy going, which mm -hmm. may or may not be true, mm -hmm. because if it's spontaneous miscarriage, there's nothing can be done about it. So I think it's deceptive 
Yeah, and there's some great work being done by historians. Actually, another impact of the pregnancy test or the very early pregnancy test is sort of a, a sort of a greater awareness of very early miscarriage uh, and sort of redefining what miscarriage is. And mm -hmm. certainly among these online communities, and we've been talking about like who are the patients or who are the users. In this case, it's a lot of re quite religious users. I'm getting the sense uh, a lot of, of Mormons, and we we can talk about that as well as a, uh, they have a large online presence, a lot of uh, journaling, a lot of blogging. Um, but they they yeah they'll do this uh, ovulation test, they'll do the pregnancy test, and then uh, they'll keep doing them. And then after seven days, the line will disappear. And they consider that a miscarriage, and they'll, they'll, they'll blog about it, and they'll talk about it on YouTube, right? And it redefines, whereas before, right, if you don't have this early pregnancy test, you have no idea that that has happened. You just have a late period. So it actually sort of changes the definition of what miscarriage is. Absolutely. I would just add, sorry, I would mm -hmm. just add for you that for the women over, over 35, now a lot of them actually get a blood test that let you know whether it's Downs or not. And you can get that around week eight or so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there actually is a reason, if you are a high risk for Downs, that you would get tested early. Because it's no, I, I think there are also companies that are marketing non-invasive testing. So it's they're done very early, mm -hmm. like really early. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the window of opportunity to get a lot of business done during that time. True. That's yeah. how I see this. And that's the yeah, and the early advertising for test says like the first sixty days are the most important. That's even back yeah. in the seventies, right? And trying to decide like if you the earlier you know, the earlier you go to the doctor, the healthier you're going to, going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and that's always been a big marketing pitch. Each of you had your hands up to ask questions. Okay, piggybacking a little bit on that, if we look at the advertisements and ovulation in particular. Since 85, have you seen a change in who they're marketed to? And I'm thinking particularly about age, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and do you have any data on who's buying these, if it, and if indeed that maps on to the community that's talking about them online, or if there's a difference there? That's a great question. So the marketing material I see in the 80s is literally behind the scenes, they're calling it their yuppie test. They said this is a group of people with a lot of disposable income, they've delayed pregnancy. And the reason I got into ovulation tests is because I am writing about geriatric pregnancies and age. And even the early ads are sort of saying like, you're running out of time. And there's a lot um, of early, like in our, there's an early 1980s ad that says, in our deferred world of family planning, like there's a lot of like, euphemisms, like you waited too long and now you need to so make sure you like optimize the fertility you have left. And so it's always been definitely targeted at like a 30 something well off woman. Um, the other marketing pitch we see increasingly through the 90s is, uh, you have a busy job. You have a professional life. Like you only can have a baby in one month. Like, like you make sure you gave birth in December. And there's actually like a couple. Like, how do you have a winter baby? How do you have a Christmas baby? Those are like actual uh, headlines and, and advertisements. Uh, the interesting thing that I've emerged from my research and just talking to people is that there's a huge market for these tests among lesbian couples who are trying to time artificial insemination, uh, sort of, do, and then either in a clinic or actually what they're just doing themselves or with a friend. Um, and that I've also found evidence in the archive of single older single women not married uh, using this once again to time artificial insemination, they buy sperm. Mm -hmm. And you can now buy sperm on the internet and they use these tests as an adjunct to try to figure out when the best time to do insemination. I don't have user data. Um, none of this, because it's all private and it's sort of you know trade secrets, and, but none of this maps onto the people who are on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I'd say the average there I see is mostly white, though often a, a lot of Latina women in their 20s on their third, fourth, fifth pregnancy, and a lot of religious language around it as well. So women who want to optimize as many children as possible, getting pregnant as soon as possible, again, uh, it's a very different group than was imagined uh, in these ads. And so there's work to be done, I think, on that. Did you want to follow up? Yeah, that? sure. Um, just so my presentation tomorrow is about non-invasive prenatal testing, the early test uh, for um, uh, fetal aneuploidy, so um, we can talk more about the parallels there, but they're really interesting parallels because I, what I will say tomorrow, I don't want to give too much of a spoiler alert, <laughs> is that um, it is sold as empowerment, this, this test for women, but it's also um, mediated by a doctor, and, and it, that, that real, the authority of the doctor is actually in the marketing materials. And I'm wondering if there's something about the fact that it's, these are tests for women they're sold as empowerment. Mm -hmm. There's something real there because women want that, and they, there were real movements for empowerment. And yet, there's a paternalism to the fact that they have to be mediated by a doctor, and women can't just do this by themselves. 
And there's there are so many directions to it. There are, there are now DIY tests to um, to do a cervical swab for for a pap test yes. that you just send into your doctor. And there there it just troubles me the the extent to which empowerment does the work of bringing women in and using these tests that they desire, and then also the 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 problems that that exist um, in the marketing of it. So I'm just trying to figure all of that stuff out. Yeah, no, I think that's the central tension of I think there are these narratives, and the idea is that it could be empowering to be able to do that yourself. <laughs> and yet, the marketing material certainly doesn't reflect that. And I am slightly skeptical sometimes when I watch some of these videos. Like how how empowering is this, right? Because it's. You're, you're, you're doing a lot, a lot of tests, you're going to your physician, you're giving them the data, right? And it, it doesn't seem like a way of sort of taking control of your health, but instead of being enrolled, right? And that's why I like this idea of the partnership. Um, uh, yeah, I think there's a, a tension there, and I don't, I don't think we should automatically think something is empowering the patient just because they can, it's in their hands, I guess. I think there was a time um, when the test first came out, the pregnancy mm -hmm. test, that doctors felt that, um, oh, now women won't need to come to me because they'll find out and they'll just go on their lives having their babies and not, not uh, thinking they need to have yes. um, a lot of help along the way. Yeah. No, that's absolutely right. And, and public health officials during that period of time, yeah, said like, well, what if people skip prenatal care altogether? Yeah, yeah. yeah um, I think they they found quite quickly that wasn't happening, and so just sort of experience this, uh, kind of calm that worry. But it absolutely is there at the very beginning, as you said. A very quick question about the changing costs of these tests. So mm -hmm. I think that you showed us an early ad for a home pregnancy test mm -hmm. that was published in Vogue. Mm -hmm. Sort of piggyback on your question, who is the targeted patient, but mm -hmm. also consumer? Um, and at that time, I'm, I'm guessing it was very expensive. And whenever I give talks in the U.S. and talk about something similar, people do not believe that you can get in Canada at a dollar store mm -hmm. uh, both an ovulation test mm -hmm. and home pregnancy test. So, I mean, it's like taking these tests out of the pharmacy and now putting it into a dollar store. So what do you make of like, the changing mm -hmm. locations and changing costs of these home tests? Yeah, there's definitely a segmentation of the market. So when their first market, as I said, uh, and with these professional upper uh, middle class couples in mind, they're 35 to $40 in 1985 per month. And it usually is like a set of three or four tests. That's a lot of money. Um, I think they think they've stayed uh, like the digital ones now, right? So the, and so the Bluetooth enabled ones, they're the gold, like the the fancy ones. They're still about forty fifty dollars, from what I understand, a box. So they're actually not cheap. And I think there are certainly companies who have segmented to say, yeah, not everyone's going to spend forty fifty dollars on the pregnancy test with all the bells and whistles. Down to the ones that we now see at the dollar store, you could actually buy them in packages. Um, and when I when I the sort of groups of communities online, they compare brands. Uh, they love doing more than one brand. Uh, they'll talk about which brands are more accurate, which ones aren't. Um, I mentioned this yesterday that the pregnancy test uh, from the dollar store is what you start with. And then if you get a positive result on that, you go up to the next level. And then if you're really sure, you get the digital one because you get to keep that, right, with the digital screen and, and everything like that. But um, some of these brands, I saw one woman bring them to her husband. She had five different pregnancy tests. She looked what I did. And he went, that's the one from Walmart, right? And that's the one from, he, he actually <coughs> knew, because he was trying to calculate how much she had spent. <laughs> uh, and this was a discussion. Um, so yeah, there, there's lots of different types of tests. It's interesting to me that people are using both high and low, um, but there is an accessibility issue here that, um, especially for teenagers, right? This is always the, the popular anecdote that teenagers are shoplifting. This is the most shoplifted item uh, at a pharmacy because it's quite expensive. And if you need it and it's embarrassing to buy, Right, it's that double. Um, uh, but also now that a dollar store enables you to maybe find out much more cheaply, because forty dollars for a teenager is a lot of money. Okay, so I think that we will end um, the session and end the day. So please join me in giving a very loud applause. To